So in this lecture, we start Chapter 7, which is on a new uh, type of kin kinetic analysis called work energy. And we will begin with, with particles. Um, and in particular, we will, we will talk about work and a specific type of energy called kinetic energy. So previously, we used Newtonian mechanics to analyze the motion of a particle or a rigid body. And that entailed using some of the forces and some of the moments. And these are the two most general forms of the equations shown. If we ever wanted to, in essence, know the effect of the forces or the moments over, over an extended period of time, we, we combined these relationships with kinematic relationships. So, so these relationships basically give us the instantaneous uh, acceleration of the of the body or particle its linear acceleration or its angular acceleration and if we wanted to know for example how this resulted in a in a change in position or a change in velocity or or something like that then we would use the accelerations that we solve for and combine them with some of the kinematic relationships we found some alternatives are, are two new approaches that we're going to learn. One is called work energy, which is what we're starting with. And it captures the, the cumulative effect of a force over a distance. And the second, another methodology that we're going to learn is impulse momentum. And it captures the accumulated effect of a force or a moment over an interval of time. And so to start, we will talk about or learn about what what work is. So work is the amount of energy transferred by a force to an object at where the force is acting through a distance. And this is the, the most general form of the equation where U represents work and the subscript captures the, the work done between states one and two. And in essence, uh, work is, is force times, times a distance times a displacement. In this equation, F is the net external force. So either you can determine the work done by individual forces, or you can determine the work done by, by a sum of forces. And R is the position vector. In the equation, that dot is a dot product. And if you don't remember what a dot product is, we'll, we'll, we'll remind you a little bit. Number one, work is a scalar. Uh, the force is a vector and the position is a vector, but the result of the dot product is a scalar. And again, that'll become more clear in a, in a moment. By examination, you can sort of deduce what the, what the units of work are. You have a force which has units of, of newtons if we're using the metric system, and you have a displacement which has units of, of length or, or meters in, in, the, in the metric system. So uh, newton times a meter becomes you know, a newton meter. That alternatively has a name of a joule. Uh, in the US or English customary system, uh, it's a foot pound. So let's look at a couple different cases of, of calculating work. So the, the easiest case is when work is done by a constant force. And so that's our general equation. If the force is constant, we can bring it outside of the integral. And so you have force dotted with, with the integral with respect to position. And that integral is just equal to, to r. And so Let's, let's go ahead and do this dot product for this, for this simple example shown below. So from examination, you can see that, that the force is, is at an angle. So it has a component in the x direction and the y direction. And so written as a vector, we have f cosine theta is the x component in the positive y direction. And then we have f sine theta in the negative j direction because it's pointed down. 
and it's dotted with, with in essence, the displacement, which from examination of the picture, the displacement is a distance d, and it's entirely in the i direction. And so it's implied that the component of the displacement in the j direction is 0. When you do a dot product, in essence, you multiply the like components and sum them. So you, you multiply all of the i components, you multiply all of the j components. If there are more dimensions, you would multiply all of the k components, and you sum them up. So the product of the i components, you have f cosine theta times d, and then you add the product of the j components, which is negative f sine theta times 0. So that second part is then in total 0, and the work done is f cosine d. What you'll see by examining that equation is that the work done by the force f, um, the work, the component of the force that's parallel to the displacement is the only component that does any work. So f cosine theta is the amount of, as the component of the force in the direction of the displacement, so it does work. But the component of the force perpendicular to the displacement does no work. So the idea is that work is a force times a displacement. If there's no displacement, no work is done. And this is an idea that, that we'll, we'll repeat as, as we go. So only the component of the force in the direction of motion does work. And this is another example. So uh, a, ma a waitress that's holding a platter as she walks across the floor. So the force that she's applying to the platter is up, but the platter is not moving up. It's only moving horizontally. So in essence, she's not doing any work uh, in holding up the platter because that, the component of that force has no component in the, that force has no component in the direction of motion. Similarly, if you're twirling a, a ball around your head on a string, the tension of the rope is pointing towards the center of the circle, but, but the ball itself is moving perpendicular to that. It's moving tangentially. And so the tension does no work because it doesn't have a component in the direction of motion. Now let's, let's look at work done by a non-constant force. And we can perform it, you know, the force and the position or displacement are vectors. And so we can choose to do this calculation in xy components or normal tangential components or whatever. So looking at, that's our basic equation, uh, the integral with the force dotted with the displacement. The force is a vector which we've represented in terms of its i and j components. The displacement is a vector which we've represented in terms of its i and j components. Reminding you of, of, of what we learned in the previous slide, we, in essence, with the dot product, we multiply the like components and we sum. So we multiply the i components and we multiply the j components and we add them up. And so the product of the i components is fx dx. The product of the j components is fy dy. We sum them. Integrals can, can split over addition, so we can then separate that into, into two separate, separate integrals. We can also do this, for example, in normal tangential components. The interesting thing about normal tangential components is that the motion is entirely in the tangential direction. We, we, we remember that. Uh, velocity is always in the tangential direction. In essence, our displacement is always in the tangential direction. So again, 
it's the same basic equation. We express our force in terms, of, in terms of its normal and tangential components. The displacement is entirely in the tangential direction. And so the implication is that the normal component does no work. And this is what, what was alluded to when, uh, when I was talking about the example with the ball being, being swung up over, over your head on a string. So we can solve these integrals you know, analytically, uh, just, just using what we've learned in calculus. But it's also often helpful to do them uh, sort of graphically. And so in this case, if you are, if you're integrating force with respect to this then you recall that an integral is the area under the curve. It's the area under the force versus displacement curve. And so that's something that we've done in the past and it will be useful again. So let's take a look at this example. So we just did a case where uh, the force was constant, and then we did another case where the force was not constant. And so we can examine these, these four different versions of the equation. So we want to try and match them to the, to the four different choices we have here. So if you look at this, um, if you want to go ahead and pause it, and try and do the match yourself, you can. Um, but so looking at the first, first version, um, we have that the force is constant. So that means that we can bring it outside of the integral. We don't actually have to evaluate the integral. And that we have that, that F is not entirely in the direction of R. So that means that only the component of the force that's in the direction of the displacement will do work. Um, of the four choices we have over here, D, D matches that. So we don't have to solve the integral. The force is constant, so it comes out of the integral. But um, only the component of the force in the direction of displacement does work. So only F cosine theta does work. The second case, we have that force is constant and that it's entirely in the direction of R. So that's going to be then choice C because the force, again, can come out of the, the integral. And since the force and the displacement are in the same direction, the dot product is just going to equal F times D. Um, all of the force is in the, in the direction of the displacement. The next uh, case is that the force is not constant, so we do need to evaluate the integral, and that the force is not in the direction of R. That means that we actually have to do the dot product of both vectors. Um, and so that's choice A. And then by default, choice B is the last one. But just by examination, force is constant, is uh, not constant. So we can't take it out of the integral. We have to do the integral. But since F is in the direction of the displacement, the dot product will just be equal to the product. You know, F and dr are always in the same direction, so their dot product is just equal to f times dr. Right, here's another example. So consider a particle being pulled up a rough slope, and so you know by rough, that sort of implies that there's friction. And so looking at this, we want to determine what are the forces acting on the particle. So again, um, you can go ahead and pause uh, pause the slideshow and, and, uh, and try and answer this problem. But by examination, um, we have the normal force, which is perpendicular to the, to the surface. We have the weight of the particle or the block, mg, which acts straight down. We have the applied force, f, which acts at an angle. 
theta with the horizontal. And then we have the friction force, which in essence opposes the direction, opposes the, the motion. And since the block is moving, the friction force will be kinetic. And so based on that free body diagram, we can, we can answer some questions. So the first question is, what is the resultant force acting on the particle? And so we have, you know, all of those forces, the friction, the normal force, the weight, and the applied force F. And we can break them down into their I and J components where we've tilted the, tilted the axes such that um, X is parallel to the incline and pointing down the incline is positive and Y is, is perpendicular to the incline and up is positive. And so looking at that, this is what the force is broken down into components, F cosine theta is the, well here it looks like uh, the solution has been written such that that up the incline is positive. So F cosine theta is the X component of the applied force in the I direction, it's positive because it's up the incline. The weight has a, has a component in the X direction, down the incline. The friction force is entirely in the, in the I direction, it's down the incline. Then you have a applied force perpendicular, a component perpendicular to the incline in the J direction, it's positive. The normal force is entirely in the J direction, it's positive. And then there's the component of the weight um, in the J direction and it's, it's downward. And so then the question is what is the work done by the, by the force on the particle? We can apply the general equation F, the integral of F dotted with the displacement dr. So you have, you know, the fact that that dr can be broken down into, into the component in the x direction dx and the displacement in the y direction dy. And you do the dot product, the i components multiply, the j components multiply. Since the, there is no displacement in the, in the y direction, the limits of the integral are between zero and zero, and no work is done because uh, you know there's no displacement in the y direction. No displacement means no work, and then you can evaluate that integral where those forces are all constants, and so it's just a constant times x, where x is evaluated between x2 and x1, and so that is the total work done. And this exemplifies some of the things that, that we've talked about already. You know, one is that only the component of the force that is parallel to the displacement does work. So the normal force does no work because it's entirely perpendicular to the displacement. Um, the applied force F, only its X component does work. The friction force does work because it's, it's parallel to the displacement and only the component of the weight that's parallel to the displacement does work. Another thing to, to notice is that if the force and the displacement are in the same direction, the work is then positive. So the work done by F cosine theta is positive because it's up the incline, which is the direction of the displacement. But the work done by the friction force and the work done by the component of the weight that's parallel to the incline are negative because they're in the opposite direction of the displacement. And so these are just a couple of sort of things to keep in mind as sort of sanity checks um, about whether or not, you know, your results make sense. Which is the height of D. The other option is just to lift it vertically straight up. And so the question that we're going to try and ask is, in which case do you do less work? In this case you do less work in case A, in case B, um, is it the same in both, or is not enough information provided? So looking at case A, um, one of the things that was said was that, uh, that with, at a constant rate, so the acceleration is zero. And so if you're summing the forces, that means that the forces must sum to zero. 
So looking at the free body diagram, we have the weight straight down. We have the normal force perpendicular, and we'll presume that there's, there's no friction or negligible friction. And so if we're moving it at a constant rate, then the forces that sum in the x direction, x direction must sum to zero. And so that means that the applied force, small f, must exactly equal the component of the weight pointed down the incline, where we're saying that x is the, is the direction perpendicular or parallel to the incline. So the applied force is equal to mg times sine theta, and the work done by that force is, is the force types of displacement, where L is the displacement along the length of the ramp. Substituting our expression for, for small f, we get that the total work done is mg L sine theta, where it turns out that L sine theta is also equal to d. So L is the hypotenuse, D is the side opposite the angle theta, and so L sine theta is equal to D. In case B, um, again, we're raising it at a constant rate, so the acceleration is zero. The only two forces are the applied force large F and the weight down, and since the, the acceleration is zero, that means that they exactly balance, and so the applied force equals mg. The distance that the displacement that the that the block goes through is a distance d, and so the work done by the large force, if we substitute for for large f, is mg times d, which is exactly equal to what we found in in the first case, and so that means that the amount of work done is the same. So, you know, using this ramp, or similarly using a pulley or something like that. It allows us to use a smaller force, but um, in essence we have to push it a farther distance, so the amount of work is the same. Here we'll do a more detailed example. Um, what we have is a cart of mass M attached to a spring that is initially unstretched and is pulled by a force F as shown in the figure. The mass moves through a distance D along the incline and we want to determine A, the work done by the applied force F, B, the work done by the block's weight, and C, the work done by the spring. So looking at this situation, in essence we're given the mass of the block, we're given the distance that the, that the block moves through, we're given the spring constant K, and this isn't something that we've talked about yet, but um, the force exerted by a spring is often modeled according to something called Hooke's Law. And what Hooke's Law says is that the, the force generated by the spring is linearly proportional to its displacement. And so this is something that you've probably experienced, but the more you stretch the spring, the harder it pulls back on you. And so the negative sign reflects the, the fact that it pulls opposite the direction you displace the spring. And the K is just a constant that represents the stiffness of the spring. So we're given those three things, and then we're also given the, the applied force F. And what we want to find is we want to find the work done by these forces. We want to find the work done by the applied force F. We want to find the work done by the weight. And we want to find the work done by the spring force. So the way that we start these problems, these work energy problems, are the same way that we started the Newtonian mechanics problems, which is to draw a free body diagram. So we have our mass. I will define a coordinate system, x, y. We have the normal force perpendicular to the, to the incline. We have the weight straight down. We have the applied force, F, which is at an angle phi with the, with the incline. And then we have the force of the spring pulling back on the block. Since the, 
the block is on rollers, we will go ahead and assume that the friction force is negligible. Starting off with the, with the applied force F, F is constant. So that means we can pull it outside of the integral expression for the work. And it's not in the same direction, or not entirely in the same direction as the displacement. So that means we'll have to do the cross pro or the dot product, and only the component of the force in the direction of displacement will do work. So this is something that we've seen before, but the component of the force F in the direction of displacement is F cosine phi, and the amount of displacement is D. And so that is the work done by the applied force. It is positive because the applied force F and the displacement D are in the same direction. Similarly, the weight is a constant and it's not entirely in the direction of the displacement. So again, we can bring the weight force out front. The component that's parallel to the, to the incline is W sine theta, looking at the, at the figure, times the displacement d. And since the component of the weight parallel to the incline is pointing down the incline, it's opposite the direction of the displacement. And that means that the work done by the weight is negative. The final one that we have is the, is the spring force. And in this case, the spring force is not constant, so we can't bring it outside of the integral. We actually have to evaluate the integral. And the spring force is minus k times x, if we recall. However, the spring force is completely parallel to the displacement. So we don't have to. To, to do the dot product, we can, in essence, treat them as scalars because they're, they're along the same direction. And the displacement, let's say the initial position is 0 and the final position is d. So if we evaluate this integral, negative k is a constant that could come out front if we wanted to. Um, the antiderivative of x, we add 1 to the exponent to get x squared, and then we divide through by 2. We evaluate it between 0 and d. And so the work done is equal to minus 1 half kd squared. So that is the, the work done by each of those three objects. And the work done by the spring is negative again because the force and the displacement are in opposite directions. concept that's related to work is power. And so power is is the rate at which work is done, where if we recall, you know, a rate with respect to time is a derivative. So power is, is the derivative of work with respect to time. Looking at our equation for for work where force is constant, we can bring the force outside of the integral and the work is just equal to the dot product of the force with the displacement. If the force is constant, just like we could bring it out of the integral, we can also bring it out of the derivative. And we are, we're left with force dotted with dr dt, where dr dt is velocity. So if the force is constant, then the power is equal to the dot product of force with velocity. So that's another expression for power, which could be of interest. The units of power, if we look at this, you know, force has a units of newtons in the metric system. Velocity has units of meters per second. So we have a newton meter per second, where a newton meter is also a joule. 
and a joule per second. Another, another name for that is a watt. Is a watt. So a watt is a unit of power. And in the U.S. customary system, it's a foot pound per second. Um, there's also the horsepower um, is is a unit, but but we won't get into that. You can you can look it up in the book if you'd like. Another important concept is is that of efficiency. This is something that you've probably talked about some in thermodynamics, but the definition of efficiency or the efficiency of a process is it's equal to the power out divided by the power in. And we'll use this epsilon to, to represent efficiency. So in essence, you can think of efficiency as, as what, you, what you get compared to what you paid. And since no machine is perfect, um, the efficiency of any process will always be less than one. You know, there will always be losses to friction or to heat or to whatever. You know, there, there is no perpetual motion machine. So, so there's two important concepts. Another concept that's important that relates to work is energy. So in general, energy is the capacity for doing work. And we will talk about several different forms of energy um, in this class. Uh, in particular, what we're going to start with is, is the notion of kinetic energy. And, and, that, and that is the energy due to the motion of a particle. And so you can imagine, you know, for example, with wind or, for, or with flowing water, that, that that moving mass of wind or that moving mass of water has energy which we can extract to do work. Um, you know, you have a wind turbine or a windmill or a water wheel where you can use that kinetic energy to do work. The expression for kinetic energy is one half mv squared, um, and we'll see a little bit later where that comes from. But it's important to note that kinetic energy is a scalar, and it's always positive because of the of the squared. So it doesn't matter um, if the velocity is in the positive direction or the negative direction. Um, it's the the energy is always positive, which makes sense because we can always extract work from the wind, whether it's blowing north or south, it doesn't matter, we can always get work out of it. Work and kinetic energy in particular are related, which, which makes sense, you know, we said that energy is the capacity to do work, so it makes sense that they're related. Um, and if we think of a block being pushed along a smooth surface, this is even more apparent, but as you push the block, as the force pushes the block, causing it to displace, you're doing work. And as you push on it, the speed of the block increases, hence its kinetic energy increases. So the, you know, the fact that you did work on the block caught it, caused the kinetic energy to increase. Similarly, if, um, if you ap applied a force opposite the motion of the block, then you're doing negative work because the displacement and the, the dis direction of the displacement and the direction of the force are opposite, so the work is negative, and the object slows down, so its kinetic energy decreases. So, you know, there's sort of an intuitive relationship between work and kinetic energy, and what we want to do is we want to derive the exact relationship. How exactly are work and kinetic energy related? That we're going to do that is we're going to begin with our expression for work, the dot product of force and displacement. It turns out, or you know, if we recall back from Newtonian mechanics, that the force is equal to mass times acceleration. So it's the the work done is equal to m a dotted with with dr. And we can evaluate this in any coordinate frame that we want, but we're going to go ahead and use normal tangential coordinates because displacement is always in the dis is always in the tangential direction. You know, the direction of velocity is always in the tangential direction. And so if we use NT coordinates, we can take what we have above the mass is constant, so we can bring it outside the integral. 
since we're doing a dot product with displacement, which is in the tangential direction, that dot product will only have a, a component um, that's non-zero in the tangential direction. You know, the, com the, the normal component of the displacement is zero, so when you do a, the dot product with the normal component of the acceleration, that's equal to zero. And so looking at that, that integral on the left-hand side, you know, evaluated between two displacement locate, you know, the initial position and the final position, that integral um, may remind us of one of the kinematic relationships we had before. A dS is equal to V dV. Where again, velocity is always in the tangential direction. So the integral a ds is equal to the integral v dv. Evaluating that, um, the antiderivative of v is 1 half v squared. And so if we distribute the m and evaluate it at v1 and v2, we get that 1 half mv2 squared minus, we get that this is equal to 1 half mv2 squared minus 1 half mv1 squared. This is using this relationship. Looking at the right-hand side of that, that equation, we can recognize the 1 half mv squared as kinetic energy. Therefore, it turns out that the work done by a force is exactly equal to the system's change in kinetic energy. So we had some intuition that that they relate that they were related, but from the mathematics we can see that they're exactly equal. And so this is called kinetic energy and work balance. And this is a concept that we're going to come back to through throughout the course of the of this chapter and the next. So let's take a look at this conceptual example. So we have two pucks on ice, i.e., you know, essentially there's no friction. One, you know, puck A has a mass of m, puck B has a mass of 4m, and we apply the same force to both. Um, and we move, move the puck from, from one line, you know, from one blue line to the next blue line. Or, or to the goal line, we'll say. And so the question is, when we reach the goal line, which puck will have more kinetic energy? Will puck A have more kinetic energy? Will puck B have more kinetic energy? Will both pucks have the same kinetic energy? Or is there not enough information given to answer the question? So you can go ahead and pause the slideshow and think about this for a second. But in essence, you know, we can determine this using our, our kinetic energy work balance, where the, where the work done is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And if we look at these two, both cases have the same F, both cases have the same displacement. So if they have the same force and the same displacement, they must have the same work. Therefore, they must have the same change in kinetic energy. And so the answer is C. Looking at the next question, or a related question, same situation, but now the question is which puck will reach the goal line first? So again, you can pause it and think about it for yourself. But we already know that when the two pucks reach the goal line, they will have the same kinetic energy because it was the same force applied over the same distance where, where the kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared but since puck A is lighter since puck A has less mass its velocity must be larger 
as compared to puck B. So that's what we find. Now we'll do a, a more detailed example making use of the, the work kinetic energy balance. So the problem statement is that the motion of a pickup truck is arrested using a bed of loose sand, which is defined by the region AB, and a set of crash barrels, which is defined by the region BC. If experiments show that the sand provides a rolling resistance of 120 pounds per wheel, and the crash barrels provide a resistance as shown in the graph, determine the distance x the 3,120 pound truck penetrates the truck's brakes fail and it is coasting at 70 miles per hour when it approaches point A. We can take the distance D of region AB to be 70 feet and we can neglect the size of the truck. So starting off the same way that we always do, write down what's given. We know what the weight of the truck is. We know that the rolling resistance of the sand is in essence 4 times 120 pounds, 120 pounds for each wheel. We know that the force generated by the crash barrels is given by the equation 600 times x squared. And we know that the velocity of the truck as it approaches point A is 70 miles per hour. If we convert that one mile is 5,280 feet. One hour is 3,600 seconds. And so that works out to be approximately 102.7 feet per second. And the distance in region AB is 70 feet. And we want to find, in essence, the distance x that the that the truck penetrates the crash barrels. So we can use this work energy balance. We'll start with region AB, which is the sand. And we know that the work done by the rolling resistance will be equal to the change in kinetic energy of the truck. And so the work done by the sand is constant, 480 feet or 480 pounds over a distance of 70 feet. And so, you know, again, the force can come out of the integral and they're in the same direction, so we don't have to really do the dot product, or the dot product is just equal to the product of the scalars. And it's negative because the, the rolling resistance opposes the direction of motion. So the work is negative. And the kinetic energy at point B, you know, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So the mass is its weight divided by acceleration due to gravity. We don't know what the velocity is at point B, but we do know what the velocity is at point A. That's the initial velocity. So we can calculate what the kinetic energy is at point A, or the velocity at point A is 102.7 feet per second. And so if we solve that equation for VB, we get that the velocity of the truck at the end of the sand, and just as it hits the barrels, is 99.3 feet per second. And then we can do region BC using the same work energy balance. So the work done by the barrels will equal the change in kinetic energy. Since the truck is being brought to rest, the kinetic energy at point C will be zero because its velocity will be zero. Since the, the force generated by the barrels is not constant, we will actually have to evaluate the integral. So the, the force generated by the barrels is 600 x squared. We'll evaluate it saying that the point at which it enters the barrels is zero. 
and the distance it penetrates the barrels is x. And the displacement will be dx. And we don't really have to do the cross product because the force and the displacement are, um, are parallel. But they're in the opposite direction, so the, the work done will be negative. Um, the kinetic energy at point C is 0. The kinetic energy at point B is 1 half mv squared. There's the mass. And the velocity at point B we found in the previous part of the problem is 99.3 feet per second squared. We evaluate um, this integral. We add 1 to the exponent, and we divide by 3. So 600 divided by 3 is 200. On the right-hand side, we have that same expression. If you solve for x, the negative signs will cancel. We can divide by 2 and then take the cube root of both sides to get rid of the, the power. 2 times 200 is 400. They have all the same. And if you calculate that out using your calculator, we get that the distance into the barrels is 13.4 feet approximately. And so that's our answer. We'll go ahead and stop there. Um, if you have any questions about the lecture, please come see me in my office hours. Um, otherwise, I will see you on Monday.